To some of the headlines, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. One of the major themes that's been raised in the Occupy movements across the country and the world is the increasing power of large corporations over more and more aspects of our lives. Well, today we're going to look at the issue of the corporate control of life itself. Our guest, medical ethicist Harriet Washington. She's just published a book that examines the extent to which what she calls the medical industrial complex has come to control human life. In the past 30 years, more than 40,000 patents have been granted on genes alone. More patents are pending. Washington argues that the biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies patenting these genes are more concerned with profit than with the health of or medical needs of patients. Harriet Washington's new book is called Deadly Monopolies, The Shocking Corporate Takeover of Life Itself and the Consequences for Your Health and Our Medical Future. She is also the author of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Harriet Washington, welcome back to Democracy Thank Now! Thank you so much, Amy. It's good Here. to have you with us. Um, why did you take on this book? I was really disturbed not only by the displacement of the traditional, more altruistic values of medical research, but also by the lack of transparency with which corporations have managed to co-opt not only research itself, but also the generation of new cures and the pricing of drugs. You wrote Medical Apartheid before this. How did deadly monopolies come out of your previous research? Interestingly enough, it didn't come out of it. I was always concerned both about medical research with African Americans and medical research with unconsenting Americans and duplicitous research. And um, couldn't combine them all in one huge monster book. <laughs> so after I did Medical Apartheid, I turned my attention to the issues that affect all of us, not just African Americans. Talk about the story of John Moore. John Moore, an iconic story. Um, he developed hairy cell leukemia, and he was told by his doctor, Dr. David Goldie, that he needed surgery to save his life, which he underwent. His 22-pound spleen was taken out, and after that, Goldie summoned, summoned Moore periodically, all the way from Alaska to L.A., for periodic tests. And Goldie withdrew samples of his blood, his semen. Goldie, his doctor. Right, right, his doctor. And um, this was all in, in order to make sure there was no recurrence of the cancer, so Moore was told. Actually, without Moore's knowledge, Goldie had taken a patent out on Moore's um, spleen and the tissues emanating from it, and with that patent had designed a huge laboratory with the backing of Sandoz Corporation. And he was actually— Sandoz, a pharmaceutical company. Exactly. So he was actually planning to market the products of John Moore's body, and John Moore was none the wiser until he finally consulted a lawyer who found the patent and found the laboratory. Who was Goldie's? Mm -hmm. Who was the doctor? Oh, the doctor was a blood specialist in L.A. So he owns the patent to John Moore he cells? He and the university jointly held the patent. And with that patent, they had a contract with Sandoz worth $3 million. But John Moore never knew of it. How did he learn of it? How did he even seek out whether there was a patent on his own body? Goldie became belatedly cautious and was pressuring Moore to sign an additional you know, consent form, to um, give Goldie total control over Moore's discarded, worthless tissues. And Moore was a bit wary. He went to a lawyer who immediately found the patent and discovered what had been done, and that the tissues were not at all worthless, of course. What role does the university play in this? The university is essentially um, the patent holder, very often, and it often sells and licenses those patents to private corporations, as this university was going to do to Sandoz. So the university stands to make a great deal of money by um, selling and licensing patents emanating from our bodies and emanating from molecules that were developed with tax dollars, our tax dollars. Talk about these relationships between universities and private corporations. They're very close. In fact, now I believe very often universities have come to look like arms of corporations. They've adopted their models. They've adopted their culture. Now it is the patent, not the patient, that's at the center of medical research. And it's profit and, and patent that is motivating decisions that universities make, just as it always dictated the behavior of corporations. Harriet Washington, you have a chapter in your book called A Traffic in Tissues. You were just talking mm -hmm. about John Moore's tissues. Talk further in a global way about this. Well, John Moore 
What happened to John Moore happened because his tissues were unusually valuable. But today, all of us with normal tissues are at danger of having the same fate, because large vo volumes of normal tissues are also valuable. And now, when we go into surgery in many um, hospitals, we're forced to sign con well, no, we're asked to sign consent forms, yielding control of our tissues to a private corporation. What is that corporation? Ardais Corporation is a, is a major one. Say if you it go again. To Ardais, A-R-D-A-I-S. If you go to Harvard University Hospitals, Duke University Hospitals, that's who ends up with your tissues. And, and many do patients do don't them? know that. Well, they're very valuable. They can use them to make new drugs, to test new drugs. Um, they have a great deal of value, especially many, many tissues for which they paid a very lower nominal fee. Talk more about this traffic in tissues, where your tissues can end up. A variety of places. They can end up in laboratories that are testing drugs. They can end up in laboratories that are basically looking for medically important molecules. Um, if they find that tissues um, secrete a certain cytokine, for example, they can sort of farm them out. Large volumes of these tissues um, are extraordinarily valuable in almost every sphere of medicine and medical research. And they are being taken from us very often, well, usually without our knowledge. Can you talk about the Bayh-Dole Act? Yeah, the Bayh-Dole Act was um, passed in 1980. Birch Bayh and Bob Dole jointly decided to, um, you know, write a bill that would allow universities for the first time to legally license and sell the products of research to private corporations. That's where all this um, paradigm shift actually began in 1980 with the Bayh-Dole Act. And talk about the significance, the effect of this, why you see this as a turning this point. This is why universities can actually sell um, products of their research to private corporations. They were banned from doing that beforehand. Also in 1980, um, the Chakrabarti case allowed um, living things to be patented. So taking these two, two things taken together totally transformed medical research. Explain that case. Um, that case was by Ananta Chakrabarti, was um, a scientist who wanted to... And where was he based? He was based at General Electric in Syracuse. He wanted to find a way to turn, um, create oil-eating bacteria. And he did a lot of innovation, a lot of engineering, and he finally came up with them. So when he applied for a patent, he was first rejected. They said, it's a living thing. We can't patent it. It's a product of nature. But eventually, the Supreme Court decided, yes, you can. And that ruling was taken very widely, very widely, to say that living things can be patented. And so now, every day, we have things like genes that are patented because of the Chakrabarti decision in 1980. We're going to come back to Harriet Washington, medical ethicist, author of Deadly Monopolies. Harriet Washington is our guest. Deadly Monopolies, the shocking corporate takeover of life itself and the consequences for your health and our medical future. Among other issues we'll talk about is what she calls biocolonialism. We'll also talk about the story of Henriette Lacks. Stay with us. In the